Changing the Collective Mindset, remarks by John Seeley Brown at the 2012 ARL Fall Forum, convened by Susan Gibbons. So good morning, my name is Susan Gibbons. I am the university librarian at Yale University, and I have the honor of of starting our session this morning called Changing the Collective Mindset. Um, And it is my pleasure to start our session and to introduce John Seeley Brown, or JSB, as he likes to be called. Um, The program's description includes a quote from Machiavelli's The Prince, which is quite fitting, we think, for this morning's session on change. It says, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in, in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Today, research libraries are struggling and endeavoring to make sense of the change in our higher education organizations. When it comes to making deep changes in our libraries, we're forced to consider what is pushing us, what is pulling us, and in what direction. What does it mean to create deep change, and why do we need to do this? What does it mean for our library workforce to bring it back to the HR focus of this entire um, session? So JSB is going to help us today by exploring the challenges that we're facing, by helping us to test our assumptions, and by getting us to think differently about the future. Now, in the package, you have the full bio of JSB, but let me give you a, a few highlights of his career. He is currently the independent co-chairman of the Deloitte Center of the Edge and a visiting scholar and advisor to the provost of the University of Southern California. Prior to those two roles, he was chief scientist of Xerox Corporation and the director of its Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park, a position he held for nearly two decades. GSB is a member of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, a fellow of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence and of the American Association of Advancement of Science and a trustee of the MacArthur Foundation. So the fact that he has time to to join us today is really quite remarkable. Um, He is a co-author of the book, The Social Life of Information, which I really think needs to be a required reading for all of us. And if you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend you do so. His current book is The New Culture of Learning, co-authored with Professor Doug Thomas at USC, which was released in January of 2011. And the last piece I want to point out about his career um, is that while at Xerox Park, he helped to develop what I refer to as the work practice study, and I hope that's the right way to refer to it. In other words, going into work environments, study how people do work, and then think about how you could create new services or new systems to improve that work environment. The first place that they went was to Cornell Library and looked at their preservation department, and then they went to uh, RIT and looked at their slide library. And if this sounds familiar, it's because that was the methodology that the University of Rochester then adopted and hired an anthropologist and for the last nine years has been using the anthropologist um, to study library users and to think about the modification. So... I was formerly at the University of Rochester, and I owe a huge intellectual debt to the work of of John Seeley Brown, Um, and I think my career has really had a different trajectory as a result of it, so I'm very much indebted to him. So it is a great honor today to introduce JSB to you, and um, I'll invite him up to the podium. Yeah, it was. A, I'm not quite sure why uh, why Xerox originally hired me, but uh, I was kind of a hardcore geek, um, and I had the wonderful opportunity to suggest that the problems facing the 21st century were not primarily technological, but primarily social. And so I changed uh, the people we were hiring from being only physicists, mathematicians, and computer scientists to then bringing up a whole new set of people, sociologists, anthropologists, actually philosophers, believe it or not, and, and artists. But they had a whole bunch of slides on what we did with artists, but took them out late <laughs> last night. Um, so I do want to talk about change. Um, I'm hardly an expert on change, um, but being at the cutting edge of modern technologies and their uses, you can't help 
but discover some secrets along the way. Um, so if you wanted an organizational theorist, you probably got the wrong person, but I can tell you a lot of war stories and some kind of bigger ideas we're now working on in terms of mammoth change, almost how do you change entire ecosystems as opposed to just um, standalone institutions. Um, I was also saying as I got up here that we're in an interesting world because uh, I work a lot in right now in, in big data, uh, one field, and obviously uh, things related to the schools of information. And I have to say that um, if there's a war for talent, you guys are it. Um, if you actually look at schools of information, um, I'm finding, I don't know, you have a couple of deans of schools of information sitting here, I think. Um, the ones I'm looking at basically are being paid, kids coming out of uh, these schools are being paid about 10% more than uh, coming out of hardcore computer science. And I believe everyone I know is getting hired. Um, so the war for talent is on, uh, especially in the fields that you have to think about, which I'm sure is going to be a, an interesting topic in its own right, um, maybe later on today. So let's get on with this. Um, I want to kind of briefly go over our context um, and then talk about what this might all mean. Um, I'm arguing that in fact, perhaps for the maybe, dramatically speaking, the first time in the history of civilization, but at least for the last 300 years, we are actually experiencing something civilization has never seen before, which is one of the reasons why we're all struggling one way or another. That's to say um, that almost all infrastructural change in the past, road systems, steamboats, railroad, um, cars, airplanes, et cetera, et cetera, have a very interesting property. There's a period in which they are first invented, and then there's a sharp kind of exponential period for brief moments of time when they make their transition into reality. Um, and then once they kind of get distributed, then they stay there relatively unchanged for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. They're long periods of relative stability and this period of long stability is when we reinvent the social practices, the work practices, etc., that take advantage of this technology. So, for example, cars, actually it's somewhat of a specialty of mine for other reasons, <laughs> you know, have not really changed in 50 or 60 or 70 years. Um, that first change is about to happen in terms of Google's autonomous driven vehicles, but Basically, cars are the same. Airplanes are surprisingly the same. The roads in this country seem to be decreasing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, these infrastructural changes, uh, you do go through this kind of moment of like, electrification of the United States around the turn of the century, last century. Uh, you know, there's this brief period that everything is shaking up. And then things stabilize out. The so people that keep saying we've never seen so much change, that's actually wrong. We often see jumps of tremendous change. The catch is it's followed by really long periods of stability in which we all have a chance to catch our breath, reinvent who we are, so on and so forth. Um, then something happened. Schools of information came along. <laughs> something happened. Uh, and what actually happened is we suddenly shifted from the era of S-curves driving infrastructural change, or underlying infrastructural change, to a period in which now our infrastructures are basically being driven by something called digital, in which basically the digital technologies, the infrastructure is of course more than technologies, we can come back to that if you want, but the digital world appears to be on a relentless exponential curve. Now I say relentless because those of you who are the physicists here know that we can't push some of the like, Moore's laws more than probably another five years. But let me tell you, it's not going to stop. This exponential law is going to take on new forms and computer architectures, um, ways of running these machines, stringing these machines together, on, so on and so forth, um, that are going to continue this path for the foreseeable future. I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years. I actually do some work in quantum computers, which provide a jump of another factor of 1,000 to 10,000 on what we're currently used to, and so on and so forth. So this ain't going to change, I think. Um, and therefore, 
we have this sense that now, about every 18 months or so, um, the technology is going to potentially double in capabilities. And you folks, better than almost anybody, know that Moore's Law is relentless in terms of what this exponential curve means, but data is faster than Moore's Law. Data is increasing faster than Moore's Law, which technically means we don't know how to handle it. If data was exploding at about the same speed of Moore's Law, then we'd be able to say, oh, we'll just use bigger computers, faster computers, and they'll take our problem, take care of our problem. But it's not working out quite that way. Data is exploding even faster. We know how, we think we know how to handle that, but and we can talk about that later if you want, but but um, this is a kind of uh, an arms race, so to speak, between compute power and big data. And that's a pretty, for those of us in this game, it's a pretty interesting set of tensions. But what I want to argue, much more to the social practice game, et cetera, et cetera, is we're entering a world because of these exponential changes uh, on the underlying infrastructures, um, is that the half-life of a given skill has shifted from when I grew up. Basically, I thought that I could be trained in X, um, and that skill would probably last 40 years, something like that. Um, now, we're down to about five years, half skill. Um, think about it a moment. The skills have to be completely refurbished every five or so years. Obviously, there are a few things that do matter. Critical thinking is more than a skill. But, um, but the fact is that we're now in a world in which we're constantly having to refresh our own skills. And guess what? There's no way that you're going to be able to refresh your skills by going back to college, universities, because universities can't handle this kind of flux. Um, if you look to listen to uh, Sir John Daniels, we're already... Um, one university per week behind the game in terms of being able to get universities to educate all the people in the world in terms of the skills that are needed. But more importantly, in this kind of relentless change um, and this kind of half-life of skills shrinking, is we have to kind of maybe change completely our eyeglasses to shift from thinking about basically stocks of assets, collections, money, whatever, um, in terms of Basically, we used to think about how do we kind of deal with kind of efficient ways to handle these, these relatively fixed assets to now a world of it's not so much the assets that matter, it's how do you participate in the flows. Um, and this shift from stocks to flows or this shift from a world of push where I could determine ahead of time all the skills you need and then educate you in a highly efficient way called mass teaching into a world of flows, which basically you have to participate in those flows. You have to be able to pull your assets, you pull your knowledge from those flows, and then you reinvent yourself every few years or so. This is a different game. But in fact, you folks, of all folks, see it in a different way. Not only is everything I just said more or less true, but we also come out of a very strange world in which, as you know, you know, genres emerge as negotiations in practice between readers and writers. And it takes often a decade or more for that negotiation to stabilize out into a fixed genre. And those genres remain relatively fixed. And those notions of what constitutes a genre determines how you do collections, how you do cultivation of those collections, and all kinds of other things like that. Well, that game has also changed the very core of your business. No longer are genres fixed, by and large. They're becoming excessively fluid. Um, and these things like transmedia are coming up into action now. Well, let me tell you, I work in transmedia. That game is changing about every year. What it even means is changing. Um, just read Henry Jenkins' book, on the uh, participatory cultures, um, you will see how fast this is changing. So we have a different game now uh, in terms of how do you actually stay ahead of these fluid genres. And I was really struck by a colleague um, up at uh, Berkeley, uh, Carlesa Hessop, Carla Hessop, on what she thinks of, and uh, actually we both do, in terms of what I'm going to call basically an epistemological shift. Let me read what she says. Quote, 
knowledge is no longer that which is contained in a space, but that which passes through it like a series of vectors, each having direction and duration, yet without precise location or limit. In the future, it seems, there will be no fixed canons of text, no fixed epistemological boundaries between disciplines, only paths of inquiry, modes of integration, and moments of encounter. The moments of encounter is a critical notion in terms of this notion of negotiation in practice between readers and writers. Um, these moments of encounter are excessively fluid. That's the world everyone in this room works in. Um, that's pretty daunting if you go to the root of what that really does mean. Um, and that, again, comes from this exponential march in terms of the infrastructures underlying this. Said differently, the challenges I think we face are both fundamental, I guarantee you they're fundamental, and substantial. We have moved from an era of equilibrium to a new normal, not a new economic normal, that's arguable, but, but to a new normal of constant disequilibrium. And I think it is safe to say our ways of working, our ways of creating value, our ways of innovating, our ways of learning, our ways of teaching, now must all be reframed. And that question of that reframing is the challenge we all have. But you know, we've seen this before a little bit. Uh, we've survived, maybe. Um, but let's look at this. And I think we're going to argue this time that our job is going to be harder than we've ever thought before. Um, because now, in this world of fundamental fluidity, where we have the epistemological shifts that Carla was talking about, um, we must now step back and not just pick up new skills, which most of us are pretty skilled at by now, um, but we must also think about how do we change our mindsets. The curious thing is, if we have to change our eyeglasses, most of us are unaware, even if we wear glasses in one way or another. We look at the world through a set of lenses. You tell me I have to change my lens. I've had no practice in changing lenses. I've had all kinds of practice of changing what I know, how do I interpret things through the lens, but not the lens itself. And I think the challenge we have before us is actually regrinding lenses, and maybe we have to continue to be able to regrind these lenses. Let me show you kind of historically an example of how easy it is to get into a rut, not challenge certain background assumptions, um, and maybe to fall into what I'm going to call kind of the competency trap. Um, because basically, as we get better and better at something within a particular paradigm, with a particular skill set, um, we actually, as we get better, we have a hard time seeing new patterns. Uh, I just want to show you historically a dramatic example of how once you get really good, you can think you can keep pushing that boundary further and further and further, and you become in, in some ways excessively more blind to a new pattern that you should actually think about shifting to. So I want to go back to the 1880s, the era of the famous clipper ships. Here was one of the most impressive clipper ships there ever was in the 1880s. Um, what it could carry was fast, furious, huge. Um, it was the king of the ships in those days. But guess what was happening? There was a clunky thing called the steamship coming along. And the steamship was kind of starting to kind of edge up on what the clipper ships could do. And so they built the Grand of Island to kind of put that race to rest. But, alas, the steamship kept marching along. But fear not, the good engineers said, we know what to do. We'll build the France too. <laughs> and if you compute the number of sails, the sail area, this, this is impressive. Um, and everybody felt good. But I think you gathered that, guess what happened? The steamship got even better. And the engineers 
and the capitalists and the crowd said, don't worry, we know what to do. We'll build the mother of all motherships. <laughs> <laughs> and they built the prison. And this monastery, this thing was awesome. The cost per ton per mile, lower and lower. Um, things look really good. But the story, of course, continues. And lo and behold, oh, the Thomas W. Lawson was crafted. This is really an impressive ship. Um, and actually, this one now shifted to a steel hull, so it was going to be really robust as well. Um, and on its maiden voyage, on Friday, December the 13th, I think I should have chosen a different day, but <laughs> on Friday, December the 13th, in 1907, it went on its virgin voyage, launching off of England. And it got maybe 100 miles, and a storm blew up, and they couldn't maneuver around the storm. And it crashed into a set of rocks and sank. And curiously, completely unlike corporate America, strangely enough, everybody died except the CEO, I mean, pardon me, the captain. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> I don't know how he was the only person saved, but he was. Uh, check it out in Google. <laughs> uh, uh, this was kind of in winds of like 60 knots. They lost control of the boat. Um, and that basically was the end of the clipper ship industry. And the world now switched to move to steamships. But that was the kind of thing that happened over like a 40-year period to basically have to reinvent the very notion of what a ship was and to move substantially to a completely different kind of technology. I think we can conclude this little example shows the competency traps can often reign supreme. And we have to think about this each in our own particular way. Um, and I can tell you later on lots of my own stories about trapped in competency traps. Um, but I think there's something that we all, I think, share in one way or another here. There is a great challenge to change not only our own beliefs, but then how do we change our institution's belief? Um, and I like to think about that as when I first went to Xerox Park and actually tried to convince the corporation that we should hire anthropologists rather than hardcore computer scientists. Fortunately, I was a computer scientist, so I could have some credibility in making that argument. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like hit, hitting your head against a brick wall. Um, the question is, how do you create action? How do you bring about change? Um, so let me just say, if you think about that a lot, most of us throw up our hands. If you deal with architects as I do, um, you know, say EGADs, um, we don't know how to do this. Um, but bear with me, let me stumble along, we can all stumble along, maybe some personal examples, and then some more general principles, especially in terms of the broader approaches, which actually brings me to, to Washington, in terms of even bigger sets of changes we're trying to pull off right now. Said most simply, and everyone here kind of already intuitively knows this, you know, part of the catch of trying to capture somebody's attention in order to pull them through a change is how do you actually design kind of evocative experiences beyond the cognitive? You never talk somebody through a change of religion. Um, you never very easily talk somebody into giving up an old skill set to pick up a new skill set. Um, so how do you think about this? Um, how do you create experiences that capture their imagination, pull them along, talk to their emotions, let them kind of engage in the gut, um, and so on and so forth? Um, and it's not too surprising to this group that narratives turn out to be pretty damn important because narratives actually go beyond the cognitive, although we could probably argue that. I want to show you uh, one example that where we use the narrative to bring about an extremely major change in the corporation and how we did that. Um, this is in the early 80s. Actually, happened, it started happening in Rochester. Uh, the, uh, we designed kind of like the, the mother of all clipper ships, <laughs> the mother of all Xerox copiers. <laughs> it was the famous 8200 machine, which is an awesome machine. Uh, 
three levels of Ethernet built inside of it, 30 processors, an AI machine that would diagnose it. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Um, I went through all the user tests. Everybody, including the CEO, could figure out how to use this machine. Um, <laughs> It did huge copying jobs, by the way. It was going like 60 pages a minute and, and duplex and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I know that sounds pretty simple today, but in the 80s it wasn't. Uh, and we put it in the market, and we lost something like a billion dollars. That's a lot of money back then. Uh, <laughs> in Washington, they say, what? <laughs> that was last year. <laughs> uh, how could that happen? How could it go through all the user tests and nobody pick up anything? And couldn't it be fixed? So on and so forth. Um, so... They gave us a machine at Xerox Park. I was just coming there. Uh, I'd already built the uh, Lucy Sussman group, uh, but we had like six anthropologists at that time. Um, so we're kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, we, have, may, we may have to invent our own methodology to do that because uh, obviously the machine never would have been turned out this bad if somehow the academic community had given us the right practices to look at user science. That was failing. Um, so what we did is we put this little machine, it wasn't a little, it was a huge machine, uh, kind of in this room, um, and without anybody for free you could use it. Um, you, you only use it if you have huge compute jobs and copy jobs, I mean. <laughs> um, but we made one restriction. You had to use it with somebody else. You could only use this machine if there were two of you using it. And you had to be willing to let us constantly run the tape recorder, the video recorder. <coughs> And, of course, what happens, uh, completely contrary to how anybody did use the testing in those days, is with two of you there, you start swapping ideas about what the hell you're supposed to do when the machine jammed, <laughs> or what this instruction actually meant. And so these wild conversations would happen, um, and which you recorded, video. Uh, and we discovered a lot. I won't bore you with all, I mean, there are many books now written on this topic. I'm on this example, actually. Um, we knew we had a serious problem at this point. We, had, we thought we'd have to pull the machine out of the market um, and basically design it from scratch again, um, leading somewhat to what machines you probably know is called the Docutex. Um, but how to get the corporate office to kind of go through the belief that we had built a million, a billion dollar baby that nobody wanted. Um, and so we took and we crafted one of the tapes of these two folks struggling to understand something about this machine. We took it to the, um, uh, to the boardroom, played it for the directors and the corporate officers. And about halfway through this like eight minute interchange, one of the people uh, slams his fist down and says, Come on, Brown. You got those guys off the loading dock, didn't you? <laughs> and I say, Well, actually, no. Uh, you might not recognize, but this is over here, Al Newell, one of the most famous professors of artificial intelligence ever to graduate, and actually a university research professor at a small place called CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. And this is Ron Toplin over here, who is probably the father of computational linguistics, or one of the fathers of computational linguistics. These are just two normal people <laughs> trying to use this ridiculous machine. <laughs> and they look at each other and says, we got a problem, don't you? I said, yeah, you got a serious problem. Um, and by the way, just capturing that one story uh, changed everything. Uh, so it was a kind of a cute little example of every once in a while, the right narrative can do a tremendous amount of work for you. Unfortunately, those narratives don't happen very often. Uh, this was so much stage. I mean, it, I have to admit that we did recordings about three months before we got this key story. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the change a corporation as big as Xerox that thought that they knew everything and they did about competency of how to build one kind of machine... Um, it was going to be very hard to convince them to the difference. Um, so let's talk more now 
about bringing about more systemic change inside your own organization. Um, and systemic change is something which is not just a question how do you do once, which is in the S-curve world would be sufficient, um, but rather how do you actually think about <clears throat> transitioning into systemic change of constant systemic changes? How do you move from transition to transitioning, if you wish, uh, to constant transitioning? And that is kind of the whole notion of how do we now have to build new types of institutional architectures, to use a fancy word, um, that are fundamentally agile. Um, and we all know that, in fact, that curve I put up um, was a technology curve. Technology, again, is not infrastructure. But actually, if you look, what's really happening is from an infrastructure point of view, there are kind of small moves in terms of building new skill sets, new social practices, um, new needed services, et cetera, et cetera, that you try to install, um, hopefully before they become obsolete. But in fact, in this world, these little S-curves that make up this exponential curve have about an 18-month lifespan. Uh, that is terrifying. Personally speaking, um, you know, just the last three of those bumps uh, where I had to go through myself, I'm a hardcore computer scientist, been trained pretty damn well, um, by the way, in the predecessor of the School of Information <laughs> at Michigan. Um, but, you know, I was kind of knew an awful lot about client-server architectures and then had to relearn everything around cloud computing. And then I had to relearn everything about how do we really run uh, what I call big data in terms of Hadoop architectures, where I now put tens of thousands of small disks and tens of thousands of computers in front of those disks. Uh, and then how do I actually understand how to use GPUs, graphic processing units, uh, that come into these like um, uh, $500 game sets? How do you take that processor and actually build a supercomputer out of it? Um, that's a fundamentally non-von Neumann machine. And everything back up to here was a von Neumann machine. Um, I had to kind of completely relearn everything uh, to do that. Um, we build actually some of our best supercomputers today with that kind of technology. Um, but in fact, you know, that's just the last six years. Those are the fundamental changes I personally had to go through. Um, and I have a pretty good network that's willing to kind of help me um, because we do most of our learning through peer-based networks these days. But that sense of this kind of change is, 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 is decidedly kind of non-trivial. And in fact, that kind of underlies what I consider to be, you back that up uh, a little bit, um, to the real challenge I had running Xerox Park. Xerox Park, we had about 250, 300 PhD researchers, um, now including the anthropologists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the catch was, when I kind of inherited running this operation for the early 80s, um, you know, how do you get researchers who are not used to taking instructions very well? Uh, and in fact, they're probably worse than full professors <laughs> uh, <laughs> because we had no soft funding. Everything was kind of guaranteed us ahead of time. Uh, and we were paid 90% of our salary came from uh, Xerox work. Um, you know, how, how do you actually think about this? Um, and given that the exponential curve I was talking about was already showing its nasty head back then, it didn't get full force until I would say uh, this century, but nevertheless, this issue of constant change was upon us. So, when I took it over, I became very much aware and that not only did Xerox have to change a lot or how it was doing things, but we researchers had to change a lot. So the first problem I find is I could beautifully characterize how much the world has changed. And I say, you know, John, that's really poetic. I'm so glad that the world has changed, but that's not for us. Um, in fact, I had the disadvantage that in those days, those of you back in those era, that era, um, Xerox Park was probably the highest flying and considered probably the, the best research group in the world. I actually think Bell Labs and IBM are equally good, but uh, the press liked us. Um, and so, Almost without fail, any one of the laboratories in my center 
the heads of those laboratories and various researchers therein would come pounding on my door saying, you know, John, um, don't you know we're the best? We don't need to change. Uh, you get that message often enough, you kind of wonder, what are you going to do? Well, it turned out that that was a really interesting challenge to be given by these folks because um, what you can do is turn that whole thing around and say, we're all researchers, right? All academics in some sense. Um, we're not just spouting opinion. We're supposed to have empirical proof of things. Um, how do you know you're the best? Uh, how do you know you're still the best? Um, and if you are still the best, how do you know you can't even be better? Um, and it turned out that framed that way, these folks got actually engaged with how would you build a metric, a measurement system that was attuned to their sensibilities, their value system, but I would actually prove categorically that they were producing more value than anybody else and couldn't produce any more value. Uh, and that turned out to be kind of a very reflective and very powerful move. We turned this all this thing around. Because any time I would create a change metric, they would say, well, the number of papers don't count and the number of grants you bring in don't count and the number of patents, you know, give you a break, John, how many patents you create, Kelly doesn't count, <laughs> so on and so forth. So any measurement you come up with isn't going to work. So it's an interesting issue to turn this whole game inside out and see, oh, hey, okay, guys, let's see it. Um, so the game here was to turn this thing into kind of a meta-research project to see if they could actually discover for themselves a truly legitimate measures that actually measured something uh, and that they would buy into. Um, that, by the way, opened up the conversation space unbelievably. Uh, um, and it turned out to be a pretty interesting, reflective experience for a year or so. Um, but then, the next thing we wanted to do, because there were really those exponential curves are coming along, um, starting kind of a year-long process getting folks in the lab out to kind of seriously look at who were the folks that were doing true breakout research. Now, after the fact, 10 years after the fact, five years after the fact, it's pretty easy to see that. Okay. This was like 1990 we're talking about here. Nanotechnology wasn't even a term that was being used uh, back then, uh, let alone how do you build atomically precise machines out of nano structures. That, that uh, nano is at, down at the atomic level. Um, and that turned out to be by visiting two or three laboratories around the world, by taking, getting these kids to get out there, um, we kind of realized that people were starting to ask questions we didn't even know about. Um, and from that, you could easily come back and start, people start saying like, should we actually get into this field? And some of you may or may not know that you know we were probably the first ones um, into, in this country, into the nanotechnology to try to kind of build a new kind of, of material science that was kind of unthinkable back then. Um, another very simple change was actually um, asking researchers when they go out, and we all go out and we love to talk, uh, we feel good about it, well, the small tiny chain saying, go out and give talks, blah, 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 build your reputation, blah, 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 feel good, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but when you come back, I want to hear from each one of you a small little one-page report on what you personally learned from that experience. Uh, and that actually started opening up their ability to listen and to kind of try to distillize, dist distill what was really going on. Um, and then the uh, the biggest change, because as you know, because most of you come from universities, college students tend to be pretty much graduate students, at least, pretty much on the cutting edge. They are often even ahead of the faculty in terms of picking up the wind of what's really going to turn out to be important. Um, and so I started a very ambitious, basically 50 intern summer program. Uh, we bring in 50 interns from around the universities, uh, actually of the world, although most came from the United States. Uh, but the, that's not too unusual. But what was a little tiny bit unusual is I would address them when they first came in, and I said, your job, folks, 
um, these to be thorns in our side. And in fact, um, I will take out each one of you to dinner during the summertime. And I want to hear your opinions. But most importantly, I want you to be thorns in the sides of all of us researchers. This turned out to be surprisingly powerful because we had invented our own computer languages. We invented everything. Uh, <laughs> no, no. You C programming? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Uh, we can build a better language, John. I said, yeah, you can. So what? But that didn't work out too well. <laughs> uh, uh, and, for example, you learn a set of tools. This is true of every one of us sitting here. Uh, and somebody comes in and says, well, you know, that tool set's kind of old. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to pick up, if, consider golf, consider tennis. You know, oh, that stroke? Jesus Christ. I'm do something different. Uh, you know. Picking up a new skill set, a new tool set, uh, actually regresses you for about a half a year until you figure that tool set out. Uh, and so it was very interesting to have the graduate students, these 19, 20, 21, 22 year old students, start to ask our august researchers, why do you guys still use that tool? Uh, and it was the disgust uh, on their face, much more important than me. <laughs> And that turned out to be a way to actually almost every other year to kind of start getting kids to question kind of why they were doing it. By kids, I mean <laughs> my researchers. I was a kid too back then. <laughs> but, uh, you know, why, why we were so slow at actually kind of taking this competency trap and not getting over it, you know, faster. Um, but that's only the beginning problem because, you know, if you actually look at the problem, the universities have this spade in terms of these silos. Um, you know, how do you actually think about something <laughs> in 10 minutes? <laughs> Very good. Uh, so what I'm going to do is not tell you about how you do physical space, social space, <laughs> and I want to kind of go ahead to uh, something a little bit more significant. Um, the, um, I will say one thing on the path to that. Uh, uh, and this I actually do more with now major corporate execs. You know, what I find, and I find this true with provosts, and, 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 and well, I've worked with three provosts now, but, but it's, it's very hard to get out of your own comfort zone. Um, and it's very interesting, how do you get somebody to even take a week out to say, go, do, go to a conference that makes you feel uncomfortable, but you don't know anything about the I think maybe, maybe, maybe there's some slight chance that you do. Um, and Jack Hittery is my hero. Uh, I ran into him a few years ago at Aspen. Um, and he developed a brilliant practice of every year taking off three days to go to a three-day conference in something he knew nothing about. But he developed a practice of how to do that. He says, here's what I do, John. The first day I sit in the conference room and I listen to the conversations, I listen to the talks, and I try to kind of pick up the technical lingo that's being used. And one day you kind of get that. The second day, I sit outside around the coffee pots. And what I do is I listen to the genres of how they talk to each other. When, how, do you, how do you discuss this kind of a field? And then once I pick up that genre, then the third day, I enter the conversation. I kind of know the terms. I get the ideas vaguely. I know how you now approach people in that particular epistemic silo, um, so to speak. Um, and then I start to engage in the conversation myself. Um, and the time I was with Jack, I watched him do this. You actually know Jack Hittery, uh, although maybe not by his name. Um, he's the guy that created... He'd never done anything on energy at all. He went to this conference where I met him on energy. Uh, he did all the things I just said. Um, and he's the guy that created the program Cash for Clunkers. Um, got this idea at this conference, went to Washington here, sold it to the White House. Um, and he also drove Bloomberg into the hybrid uh, cab taxi program inside in New York City. Uh, so, and ironically now, he's chairman of the energy Commission, uh, but he still does it for something new. <laughs> so um, you know, it's just been very interesting to see see this happen. What I want to
talk about um, is two notions we might call change. Um, uh, I called uh, the first one kind of change 1.0 and change 2.0. Um, this is a beautiful little article called The Rhythm of Change by my, my book, Henry Mintzberg, who I know. Uh, I don't know the other guy. Um, some of the best organizational theorists on change. A beautiful kind of simple quote. Change has to be managed with a profound appreciation of stability. And in this game of change 1.0, I said, well, you know, <clears throat> there are three kinds of changes. There's kind of the dramatic change. We're talking the corporate world where the CEO dramatically says, we must do X. Um, sometimes it works. Uh, there's also down at the bottom in the grassroots, there's kind of a sense of an organic set of changes. The folks are figuring out they want to just do things differently, and they're doing kind of local improvisations uh, and so on. And then kind of coming from the side, they're more kind of systematic procedures such as how do you do your performance reviews and how do you do new types of 360s and all this kind of stuff. How do you start to systematically put in some of these new practices? And they say, like, you know, <clears throat> something very interesting happens. You've got to think about these three kind of approaches to our change. He said, <clears throat> there's a rhythm that starts to develop. Because from the top, dramatic change alone can be, guess what, just drama. Systematic change by itself can be deadening. I think we all know that. <laughs> and organic change without the other two can be chaotic. They must be sequenced and paced over time, creating a rhythm of change. A rhythm of change that honors the value of stability because most of what we do does stay the same, but we have to then be able to focus on what really does matter. And I think that was kind of a very kind of interesting observation. Um, and it worked pretty well. But I want to now talk about change 2.0. Um, I got into this myself. This is actually why I'm in Washington right now. Um, because it hit us partially because of the Arab Spring and some other things that were happening. That We know a lot about kind of diplomacy as a form of change. Um, but we think about it in the 20th century as basically a topic of statecraft. All our diplomacy is based on from the top down, the dramatic coming down from the top. Um, and we know a lot about how to do this, not too many blocks from here. At least we think we do. Uh, but in the 21st century, as we kind of woke up and discovered, there's also something that we don't know much about, street craft, which is kind of the organic change we were talking about in terms of the change 1.0. The interesting question is, how does dramatic change up here, statecraft, actually start to meet basically street craft? How do you take the things that are happening down here, and how does the thing up here start to create a gradient force of a pull that actually pulls these things into a collective action? For example, the Arab Spring, is, as you know, turned out to be pretty much of a disaster because they were against something, not really for something. Uh, being against something can get something going. But once you get that thing going, there's no kind of clear notion of what it is you're really trying to do. Um, and so basically, this whole sense of how do you kind of begin to understand from the bottom up and the top down. Um, and that got us actually thinking about this for some bizarre reasons. Um, and we took as a guiding example in, in rethinking this whole problem a movie, Minority Report. Now, how many here have seen the Minority Report? I hope almost everybody. Um, what you may not know is Minority Report had a very key person, Alex McDowell. Um, you know him now through a bunch of other more bizarre movies. Um, but Minority Report did not have a script. It was the first movie created without a script. What Minority Report did is it actually built a world. It envisioned a world and envisioned, basically, it built up a mock version of this world, mostly electronically, uh, although not all, um, so that basically the producers 
the actors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, could live in this world and build this world together in terms of various types of concentric circles having to do with social practices, technology practices, all kinds of things they were building up. And they got this world built in a way that they could, they, they lived in this world, very, like, very much like a really professional actor can do. They started to assume the properties of that world, and then out of that, what emerged was the minority report. That was not particularly scripted. Uh, now that's only partially true. We now have gone much further than that, but that's the way that that, um, that, that, that was the first kind of example of this. So what we really saw is there was a sense of the minority report to kind of create a vision, going back much more to the etymology of the word vision, is about sight, perception, and the imagination. So they started to construct an imaginary world. Um, and it's about kind of world building, um, kind of building out the full kind of context of that world. Um, you've seen that before with Star, uh, with, um, Star Wars. George Lucas built seven worlds. Actually, he built so six worlds, but maybe a seventh we don't know about. Um, and then he shot the movie starting at world number four because he could actually show that he understood the history of how this world came to be and then what would happen with the world. He wanted to construct the silos of worlds so that he could kind of, and the actors could live in this world with some much more deep understanding of the social mores, all these things that would define that world. Um, so change 2.0 that we're looking at now is how do you actually start to construct a vision um, that kind of prepares a certain kind of, I'm going to call it a meta-narrative that sits above the stories and then looks at the kind of the micro-narratives that are happening on the street. This can be inside your own organization. It can be in Afghanistan where we're actually trying some of these ideas out, Colombia uh, uh, as well, et cetera, et cetera. And looking for kind of how do you find kind of a vision um, and kind of the role of this meta narrative that is kind of really compelling, aspirational, but this is the weird thing strategically ambiguous. So let's shift from Minority Report to Robin Williams' beautiful movie book, The um, Dead Poet Society. Uh, I think you've all seen that movie or read. Um, what did he actually do? What he did in that movie is for the kind of seven kids in his class, is he had this notion of a meta-narrative. The meta-narrative at one level was be the most extraordinary version of self you could be. And the real meta-narrative, he said in Latin, what translated was seize the moment in order to be the most extraordinary version of yourself. So that was a meta narrative that is inherently ambiguous in terms of the micro narratives of the different people in his class. But he would find the right moment to take that and say, seize the moment. Uh, and that moment then led to an epiphany that basically altered the life of each one of his students. Some so dramatically that one, you know, committed suicide because he changed so much that his parents kind of went berserk and he went berserk. Uh, now it turns out we've been looking at this, can't talk much about it, but in Colombia in terms of the drug trade game, um, and I had a beautiful chance to kind of run into the new chief strategy officer for IBM who had just actually unwittingly, with the CEO, the new president, uh, uh, construct their own new meta-narrative. The new meta-narrative, without using that terminology, although he agrees that this was the right, what he was doing, um, is IBM, the essential company. And the idea of calling it the essential company has very interesting overtone to it. Let that well in that a moment. And then he said to each, and she said, to each kind of employee, be essential. You can figure it out for yourself. 
but be essential. How do you convince yourself you are being essential? Uh, and let's do it authentically. But, you know, it just blew my mind that that idea has just galvanized in the last like, few months. IBM created a kind of strategic alignment and yet honors in some sense stability but also honors saying each individual figure that out for yourself and we the company will figure out what makes that essential as the companies and it's um, you know I haven't kind of fully materialized that myself I mean it was an amazing conversation I had with him um, in, Col- in Colombia <coughs> uh, bringing the, the, the drug lords and the government dot 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 uh, very complex story that's not uh, that isn't yet public I mean we're not allowed to talk too much about it but uh, uh, the meta narrative is in English no more blood believe it or not every single warring group has bought into that meta narrative uh, is strategically ambiguous interpreted completely differently by each group but that they could buy into. Uh, there's something kind of... So I think this idea of then how do you do that? Uh, I mean, how do you create them in a narrative? How does it honor the micro-narratives? Each of us have our own stories about ourselves. And then what are the mechanisms <coughs> that one might use to kind of pull the micro-narratives into alignment with the meta-narrative and so on and so forth? Um, and how, besides these mechanisms, we might do that might you also use social networks to kind of amplify the ability of the meta narrative to take hold of the micro narratives and so on and so forth? Um, so this look at this a moment. The meta narratives we think of as in terms of a world building. Uh, the mechanisms for the um, uh, um, on, on the side could be things like transmedia. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, one of the most beautiful examples of uh, how transmedia may have worked out. I don't know how many of you know the world without oil. Um, it's an amazing computer game, network game. Tens of thousands of people play it. Um, it's basically a, a world-building activity. By the way, the best example of, of world-building um, is Harry Potter. Harry Potter has a fantastic ability to build an entire world. Uh, uh, Star Wars is another example. But, uh, but you know, that, that created the world that you could then enter. Uh, it's one of the reasons why kids... They, you can't take Harry Potter away from a the kid. Uh, they have entered that world, and they've made that world, that strange world, very familiar in very interesting ways. The world without oil, uh, they've had tens of thousands of people play that game to try to live in a way of suppose we had no oil. Um, and they use then the social networks to be able to pass ideas back and forth, dot, dot, dot. It's one of the few games I have actually seen as an augmented reality game, an alternative reality game, more technically called, um, that actually has led to fairly major change of behavior of many of the people in it. The reason why we're interested in this today is if you look at the problems of uh, chronic disease, um, we're looking at how might you use some of these mechanisms to actually crack the problems of chronic disease in terms of finally finding a way to change your behavior. We have a lot of really cute... um, apps on our iPhones, they kind of give us all kinds of measurements, but they don't change behavior. And so the one of the questions is, how do you start to do that? That's the mechanism we're talking about here. And then in your own organization, you want to think about, in terms of what are the structural holes in terms of the networks of communication in your own organization? Uh, so these are some of the kind of you know technical tools that we now have. Um, with that, I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. There are microphones across the room. You know, it's, it's curious because let me uh, let's step back a moment, and, and I'm sure you know this uh, you know, from your own experiences, but I'm constantly being asked about the return on attention, the, the, the lack of attention that people, kids have, the lack of interest in reading that they have, and their inability to write. Um, on the other hand, I study Harry Potter, I study what these kids do. Um, I don't know how much you've been tracking, but these kids have fan uh, Harry Potter sites. Um, last I checked, 
There has been 1,500 books of over 400 pages per book written by these kids. There are probably 100,000 or more on each of two sites in terms of kids writing amazing things about the backstories. And so they're evolving a new form of close reading. They are taking the white space and building the backstories that actually suggest what's really going on, what could be happening next. Uh, they're filling the whole thing out. And so I find it interesting that we think of these kids as being very superficial. But in fact, the ones that I study are doing, and they have invented a new form of close reading. Um, and so we have to be careful. The, the purpose I brought up transmedia is that sometimes if you look at what they're doing on one media, you're not really aware of what they're doing in other media. Uh, so it looks like they're kind of just always multiplexing, but if they're on the other media actually building the backstories for the front media, you know, that is a new form of close reading. Now, but it doesn't happen all that often, but, but, but it does happen enough to pay attention to. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of the tasks we have is we got to begin to realize that when you have these multiple media, you may use one kind of media for one kind of backstory and another kind of media for something else. So I actually find that um, there's much more focus of attention than we might first think. Uh, and we have to be a little bit careful. We've done, as you may know, you know, probably the biggest ethnographic studies of, of today's digital millennia uh, around the entire United States, not just in the Silicon Valley types um, or New York. Um, and, and we're not finding this to be as big a problem as we first thought. And since I spend most of my time you know, working with and talking to corporate officers and CEOs, I actually find the attention span of CEOs much less than kids. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I know that I'm in the boardroom. I have about 30 seconds to capture their attention. Now, if I can capture it for the first 30 seconds, I have two whole minutes to make my point. And if I can actually use a graphic story, graphic can have multiple meanings, <laughs> uh, to, to do that, I may carry the day. And so, you know, what we really do have is, I mean, I, I don't think this attention span is actually that new a problem, completely contrary to what's in the public myth. That's highly debatable, by the way. <laughs> now, he may be, oh, okay, I thought you were in the bathroom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tito Sierra from MIT. Can you elaborate on the point of a strategically ambiguous? It seems like a very fascinating concept, but can you elaborate on why the ambiguity is important? Oh, the ambiguity is important um, because well, you have to, what you need is something that's underdetermined so that um, for the particular kid, I can, in this particular case, instantiate, you know, he and I, or they and I, and for the particular person, can actually craft what my meta narrative means relative to the micro narrative of that kid. And so you need one thing up here that can actually be interpreted to make it completely personal down here. Uh, so that, that's kind of the idea behind that. So, the, for example, the essential corporation. I mean, what does that really mean? Well, it gets me to ask myself, what am I doing today that's essential? You know, it's that ambiguous. And yet, relative to my personal micro-narrative of why I'm at IBM, or what I'm trying to achieve, I have no trouble answering that when posed that question. Uh, and so it's a sense of, of you know, how that produces attraction and focus on the micro-narratives down here, but still creates kind of a sense of togetherness. Um, now, that's a, I mean, this is pretty new kind of thinking. I mean, we're playing it out you know, in terms of world politics right now, and I mean, we're trying some stuff, but but the uh, I was so happy to see IBM, because if you really take this big shift seriously, what we're going to do, as you know, in universities, is our old institutions, the architecture of those institutions have been turned inside out. Um, and it may just be that the old institutional architectures structured everything so well, 
we always felt we knew exactly what to do next, more or less. Um, if we're going to bring agility to the forefront in the, as a new kind of institutional architecture, then what creates alignment? And let me tell you, the strategic intents of every group I know, when they tell them to me, as I just go to sleep. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, and so we're trying to figure out what might work in terms of actually, you know, pulling people, but yet honoring the individual. Our terminology is, is somewhat in flux. I mean, these terms are only like three months old. <laughs> It's, the, uh, it's developed in this new book. I mean, the book will be out. I mean, the book will be finished at the end of this month. <laughs> um, yeah. I happen to have said that three months in a row, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> if, in fact, you have a culture of collaboration as opposed to a set of processes of collaboration, um, and process is not the same as culture. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I actually think that the, a culture of collaboration actually has more to do with listening, uh, deep listening. Um, and if you're capable of listening to each other, especially across epistemic boundaries, um, and listening with the ability to honor, um, then you have tremendous agility. So I actually see those things very much in alignment. If you have it as a set of real, practi real practices and processes, then you've got a problem. But it's, I, I think it's a crucial distinction. The, in fact, the reason that I accepted your kind invitation to come is uh, I'm actually here because of higher education. Uh, um, I just came from the convocation at, at Georgetown two days ago, uh, and blah, blah, blah. But um, the, um, as you may or may not know, I, I kind of education is one of my hot horses, hobby horses, etc. I've never seen as much fear and confusion about higher education in the last six months than the last 30 years. Um, the shot across the bow has been fired. Uh, I call it mukamania. <laughs> um, I can't tell you um, the number of presidents of major tier, you know, or, universities that have been calling me saying, you know, um, will you come in and talk to me and my staff about what may be going on? Um, we all know that the old game is up. Um, partially because of the new technologies, although those technologies really aren't that new, but they you know, give a good name, you've got one. Uh, um, but also because of the financial challenge. So let's take the MOOCs for the moment. I mean, by the way, the MOOC itself is a piece of technology is blah, blah. Um, the, um, what it does through flipped instruction is, of course, gives you the chance to say, let's use the classroom in a fundamentally different way. Okay? And in fact, if all you're doing is learning material in terms of kind of conceptual material and facts, um, then maybe we don't need to have these highly uh, um, these courses of two or three hundred people per classroom in the first two years. They can be done maybe in better other ways and everybody should be happy about that except there's a dirty secret uh, and the dirty secret pays some of your bills in your libraries that the dirty secret is there's a power law distribution 80% um, of the revenue comes in 20% of your courses. And it is exactly that 20% that the MOOCs may attack. So if you think that you've got a financial war going on now, the long-term consequence of the MOOCs, if they get figured out, could radically change the economic basis of higher ed. Uh, that's why I think the provosts and the presidents are beginning to worry much more about, oh my God, you know, the foundations of how we've been running this corporation, which we don't ever want to talk about. We had to actually subpoena the records of one of the universities to find some of this stuff out. I was in a task force to look at this. But nobody wants to talk about the cross-subsidization that's going on. Um, so that's, 
another force here. Um, and you have this $1 trillion debt of student loans. Um, so you have the perfect storm happening. At the exact same time that this technology rears its head and says, oh, we can, we can train a million people. Um, I would both quote train. Um, and so I think that uh, I think all of a sudden people are honestly saying, what do we need to do? What could we do with the new tool set? Um, and is there a new way to think about this game? Um, you know, the irony is, in fact, I thought the reason you first asked me, and it turned out not to be at all, because uh, <laughs> it's a different set of libraries. But, uh, you know, some of us uh, have been very much engaged in reconceiving the community library uh, with our argument that the community library is going to be the center of learning for most kids in the future. Um, and they're going to be kind of hacker spaces, make spaces. If you look in Chicago, the U Media work there is, is spectacular, um, and so on and so forth. So I think you're going to find more and more, you're going to find a complete new conception of the role of the community library. Um, you know, it's going to kind of take advantage of the fact that um, the, the Ewings have locked the formal schooling down in a way that most learning happens with after school programs. If you look at the learning ecology, the ecosystems inside cities in terms of all the resources that kids actually use today, one of the reasons we're looking at new ways to do badging is how do you get kids to be able to get some credit for what they've been learning outside of the formal school? The libraries are going to play one more key role in that. So, I mean, I think that, that the, um, through the K through 12, game, or uh, 6 through 12, uh, you're going to find libraries playing a huge new role. Um, so therefore, I think K through 12, 12 through you know, 16, and 16 through 20, you're going to see huge changes in each one of those. Um, I think that's why the ability to kind of really look at new lenses to what what is becomes, not to make a pun, essential, <laughs> uh, and how to play that game. Uh, and I think we're going to see some very new, interesting proposals coming forward. Uh, the one thing that's really nice about it, and I was at a curious meeting where um, the argument was made that anybody who thinks, for example, Google replaces the library, the research library, you know, has no understanding of preservation. So there's certain things that you guys do that are so incredibly critical, of which nobody values until after the fact. At that point, is too late. So you know, there's there is uh, you talk about creating a new meta narrative. You may want to start thinking about a meta narrative about preservation <laughs> uh, because it is critical. Um, and how do you, and, and by the way, preservation is getting almost impossible given the flood of information going on. Uh, and how do you do the curation of that? Well, you know, you got to. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm from USC, so the Shoah Foundation's preservation project with those videos, you know, I can appreciate even with our infinitely high technology is decidedly non-trivial. Um, and Spielberg wants it done at the bitwise precision level. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I, I, what I worry most about in higher ed is the things that may have the most value are the things that are seen. They're kind of below the radar screen. And we don't necessarily know how to articulate the value of that um, until it's kind of too late. Um, and you can say, well, save everything. Well, that doesn't mean make much sense either. Um, save everything at what preservation rate? How well do you want to save it? Uh, so on and so forth. And I think, uh, um, you know, you, you guys are, again, in, in this perfect storm, and not only the financial storm that we were just talking about, but an information is exponentially exploding faster than Moore's law. Uh, you're hardly getting being given the money to be able to handle some of these problems. But you know, I, I come out of this work on storage. You know, the ways we're now architecting storage, you know, today as opposed to three years ago, it boggles my mind. Um, I mean, using you know, how do you do how do map reduce for this kind of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, you, you, the university's not even training. Schools of information are finally getting at it. Uh, computer science departments are actually kind of behind the eight ball of some of this stuff. So, uh, you know, you've suddenly gone to the outer edge of technology. 
So the needs are greater than ever, the technology is greater than ever, and anybody willing to invest it is less than ever. Is that a good summary of your job? <laughs> <laughs> well, John, thank you very okay. much for a very good point. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.